Hi, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, self-hosted remote cloud gaming sort of optimizations we can do to this. And I'm sort of glad Justin went first to explain sort of some basic concepts of how this all works. So first, I want you to imagine the worst situation possible. You have to go to the DMV. What do you do? You can play your remote cloud gaming uh, that's like self-hosted on your PC and infrastructure uh, with your phone. Right? And so there's these little clips that attach to controllers that like, give you a view of your uh, monitor from home, uh, and you can control it with the controller that you have there. Another situation is uh, couch gaming, and lots of people just buy like a PlayStation or whatever for this. And uh, I think it's a lot better idea to buy just a PC, and then you have a multi-purpose machine that can play gaming, and you can also like, do your taxes and things like that with a PC. And so there's lots of sort of uh, advantages to thinking about uh, how you want to game remotely with your own infrastructure. Um, okay, so who am I? I'm a third year PhD student at North Carolina State University. Uh, my research focus is on 5G core networks. Uh, ask me about that after the talk, because that's not what this talk is about. But uh, I got my master's in 2020 from NC State as well. And I got my bachelor's from ECU, which is East Carolina University, which is also in North Carolina. Uh, I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina. And if you see that building there, that's the building I work in at uh, NC State. Um, so first, let's talk about what is remote cloud gaming. So traditionally, this is we take a cloud computing infrastructure and we charge uh, like a monthly fee. Microsoft would charge like a $15 monthly fee. And then you get access to play whatever you want on there infrastructure. And the advantage of this is obviously you don't have to buy specific hardware to play anything. You can just play on their uh, infrastructure, right? And you can use your phone, you can use a Raspberry Pi, you can use your TV, you can use anything to sort of stream this uh, from anywhere that has an internet connection. And uh, the biggest problem with this is the latency, though. And Justin uh, mentioned this during his presentation, that latency is sort of the biggest problem. And where he solved this with Kubernetes, I'm not going to solve that with Kubernetes. I'm going to do a different approach. Uh, so just a little uh, side fact is that with 5G, they're sort of hoping that uh, when the infrastructure is all built out, we'll have less than 10 millisecond latency to various services. And so uh, a lot of these little tricks that I'm going to show you may not be necessary because we already have low latency with 5G. Um, OK, right. So I mentioned latency is the biggest problem. And this is uh, if you ask you know, traditional gamers who are playing you know, Counter-Strike or whatever, latency, the difference, uh, like 10 millisecond latency, is too long to wait. So if you are fighting somebody and you click your mouse to shoot your gun and the other guy clicks it at the same time, because you have additional latency because you're playing in the cloud, you're going to lose, right? The other person's going to like shoot you first. Um, and so this is the biggest problem with uh, gamers who are thinking about doing cloud gaming. Um, so there's sort of two schools of thought with how you can set this up. Uh, Justin went over both of them, so I'm glad he did because I'm not going to go over them. But briefly, there's uh, Steam Remote Play, which is sort of easy setup and has low latency. And then there's Sunshine and Moonlight, which is the open source alternatives that uh, provide lower latency and harder setup. There's various tutorials and blog posts and Reddit posts and presentations here about how to set this up. Uh, so I'm just going to skip over that. And I'm going to do more of a day two sort of optimizations guide with how, what, what do we do once we set this up. Uh, right, so what network optimizations can we do over Tailscale? The first thing is you need to figure out your NAT traversal strategy for uh, getting a direct connection to your devices remotely. And uh, Tailscale will go over a relay if it can't figure out how to uh, go through your NAT in your home system. And basically, when I was testing with this at NC State's campus, I was getting about 60 millisecond latency. And when I port forwarded uh, the WireGuard ports, I was able to reduce this down to 25. So nearly half, right, half my latency just by setting up and going through the network configuration of figuring out NAT traversal. Um, the next thing I want, I'm glad we got a Steam Deck a little bit earlier, too. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Steam Deck. Um, if that 25 millisecond latency is still too much, I want to introduce a new concept of, that involves the Steam Deck that solves two problems. One, 
we're going to eliminate latency entirely with remote cloud gaming. And two, we're going to be able to install games that are uh, larger than the size of the smallest Steam Deck right here. So it's 64 gigs. Um, and so the era of 100 gigabyte games is upon us, and there's various games that have come out just this year that are larger than the, than the smallest Steam Deck, and we can't install them because there's not enough space. So what do we do? Um, I'm going to introduce this concept called remote storage gaming. So traditionally, we think about remote cloud gaming as streaming video and audio from a remote system and uh, streaming back your inputs from your controller. With remote storage gaming, I'm saying we take a hard drive from a remote PC and we mount that as a NAS device, and then we can install games and run them with our local hardware. Uh, the benefit of this is when you're playing a game that needs low latency, your inputs don't go over the network directly. They're processed locally on your PC that's running the game. Um, so you don't have uh, like that Twitch reaction situation where you know, two people are shooting each other and because uh, one has a delay because they're playing in the cloud, that doesn't happen, right? Because everything's being processed locally now. You don't, you don't, you're not relying on a cloud server. And the biggest benefit of this is you save hard drive space and you can play games where your Twitch reaction, uh, Twitch reaction moments uh, don't really matter. Um, you, you get, you, excuse me, you get, you, you lose some of the benefits of the traditional cloud gaming approach with this in that you can't run this on any device anymore. You can't run this on your TV, you can't run this on your phone, but you can run it on your Steam Deck. And that's sort of the use case I'm thinking about for this remote storage gaming. And so you sort of need to depend, uh, when you're thinking about what game you want to play, you need to figure out which approach you should take for installing the game before you do it. So do you want to play remotely where your Twitch reactions uh, reflexes maybe don't matter as much, like a single player game or something that's like turn-based strategy kind of thing, you don't really need Twitch reactions. But if you want to play Counter-Strike or something, uh, you might think about Let's install this and deal with the longer load times of streaming a hard drive over the network, over tail scale. Uh, the next sort of optimization I want to talk about is power usage. And this can be used in both the remote cloud gaming and remote storage gaming situations. So uh, basically, the problem we're going to run into is if we want to play remotely, we're going to have to leave the PC on all the time, right? And we don't want to do that because that's extra energy. Uh, elect ec extra electricity in our electricity bill. And so we need a way to remotely turn on and off the PC. And so what I've done is I have a small uh, single board computer, Raspberry Pi, on my uh, home network. And whenever I want to turn on my PC from my laptop or from my phone, I can just send a little SSH command to the Raspberry Pi. And the Raspberry Pi will send a wake on LAN to my PC in my home network and it will turn it on and let me know when it's uh, turned on and the network's all set up and ready to start streaming. Um, and so you can also use a smart plug. Uh, so if you plug your PC into a smart plug, you could use your uh, smart plug app on your phone to remotely turn on the PC as well. Um, but I would recommend using a single board computer for the next slide I'm gonna talk about, which is expanding this into doing more than just turning on your computer, okay? So you turn on your computer, well, actually, let's rewind. So I use uh, uh, Proxmox on my gaming PC. It's sort of an open source um, operating system that lets you manage virtual machines and containers. And it runs on bare metal. And you, when I turn on my PC, it doesn't turn on my gaming VM, right? So I need to turn on a VM after I've turned on the bare metal machine. And so I use my Raspberry Pi to turn on my VM on my machine after I've performed a wake on LAN. But I want to emphasize, like, this is a very unique situation, and I know no one's using Proxmox on their gaming PC, but you can do various other things with uh, this setup as well. So I have an example. You could start the game automatically when the PC turns on, or maybe you want to use this for work and you start Zoom automatically because you're in bed and you don't want to get up. Uh, so it's all ready when you get there. Um, and there's management interfaces for Windows called Windows Remote Management uh, that lets you 
do various things on Windows, and of course on Linux we have SSH commands that can do anything. So next is about um, Home Assistant. So you can integrate all these extra commands into your Home Assistant and connect all your smart devices together um, to do various things for you. So I use this uh, specifically to turn on my PC when uh, it's 8.55 a.m. and you know I work at nine o'clock. Um, and you can, sort of, you can sort of imagine, I'm sort of trying to give you ideas about what, what you can automate with this sort of idea. Um, and so I use this uh, when I have a meeting, uh, 10 minutes before my meeting, I'll turn on my PC or uh, turn off my PC when there's no activity for a long time. And uh, so that's what I use for Home Assistant. Uh, so in summary, uh, self-hosted remote cloud gaming is sort of the future where we're thinking about um, lower latency. Um, and I talked about reducing your latency, how you might go about doing that. I talked about remote storage gaming, which is sort of rethinking uh, cloud gaming into let's stream the hard drive instead of just streaming audio and video. And I talked about reducing power consumption and additional automations. There's various other uh, code snippets that I wanted to show, but I felt like I didn't have time. So uh, one thing is making sure you have your access control policy in tail scale to allow only the ports of the remote cloud gaming. So Moonlight and Sunshine, they have various ports that they use. So you need to make sure you set up your access control policy. I have Home Assistant, uh, little samples, and I have various other things that you can uh, look at online that I have posted. Uh, I think it's private right now, but check in about five minutes and I'll make it public. Um, and that's all I have. So thank you for coming to my talk. <laughs> <clears throat>